Good afternoon. My name is Ben Greenfield. I'm the Director of Marketing at Helmer Scientific. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Ultra Low Freezers, Troubleshooting and Maintenance Tips. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar using the questions pane in the webinar control panel. We will have time to answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers. Mark Kehoe is a technical service specialist focusing on field service, product development, and serviceability at Helmer Scientific. Prior to working at Helmer Scientific, Mark has 30 plus years of field service experience at a global pharmaceutical manufacturer and has held positions as lead refrigeration mechanic, building engineer, as well as owning his own HVAC and refrigeration company. Brian Hoagland leads the low temperature products research and development team at Helmer Scientific. He has over 20 years of experience in project management, systems engineering, and mechanical technology. Without further delay, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Mark and Brian. Thank you, Ben. Welcome to the training class. We're going to start with talking about troubleshooting a Cascade ultra-low system. Uh, this subject will not include any of the other Cascade refrigeration systems, but just more common Cascade ULTs. We're going to talk about some of the common symptoms you're going to find. We're going to talk about some of the troubleshooting tips and some of the tools that you will need for each of the scenarios we're going to present today. Preventive maintenance and how to prevent reoccurrence of the, of the situation that you might see. The agenda is going to be covering is going to be general tips, uh, which is going to highlight techniques specific to cascade systems, troubleshooting a fast temperature rise, and troubleshooting a slow temperature rise, and what the difference is with those. General tips. The biggest tip that we can provide you is that the last thing you want to put on a ULT is going to be a gauge set. Gauge sets are going to introduce contaminants, moisture, air, and most important, they're going to provide a loss of charge in the unit. These units have a very small charge, especially in the low stage of refrigerant, and a lot of times you're going to find a blended refrigerant in there. When you lose that charge, you're going to have to evacuate it and start all over again. So that is the last method of troubleshooting you want to use. We're going to talk about being comfortable with using temperature to represent pressure. In refrigeration, if I have a specific temperature, I'm going to have a specific pressure. It's that way with every refrigerant that you have in the field. One of the first things you want to do is diagnose your high stage, or what we call the first stage. So we're going to diagnose that. That has got to be operating even before the second stage will start. Then we're going to talk about the low stage and what to look for when it comes to troubleshooting that and how to utilize the heat exchanger as your main troubleshooting point when it comes to troubleshooting both the first and the second stage and how they work together. We're going to take advantage of some of the manufacturer data, the graphs, the monitors, and some of the thermocouples that are provided in the units. So two of the reliable tool, two of the tools you're going to need are going to be a reliable digital thermometer, as in a Fluke 52 that will read thermocouples or an omega meter, and a multimeter or an amp meter. When you open up a unit, you're going to see an electrical panel, electrical access. Make sure you have adequate room to get in and do your troubleshooting when you look in there. We're going to talk about some of the TXV or capillary tube where it sits and how they interact with each other. Some of them will have a distributor associated with it, some will not. And you're also going to look at start components, condenser motors, and pressure switches. Make sure you have access to those when you're doing your troubleshooting. So good afternoon, folks. This is, uh, this is Brian. So I'll steal the floor from Mark for the next couple of slides. Uh, so there's no way that we can go into deep detail on the nuances of a cascade system in the time we've got today but I think it's important to get a level set for everybody on the call. So I think the best way to do that may, may be to follow the heat flow through the system and highlight some of the important temperatures for troubleshooting along the way. So Mark mentioned two things that I really want to reiterate. The use of uh, temperatures instead of pressures in troubleshooting and take advantage of the temperature data that manufacturers make available. So I think we'll demonstrate that in the next two slides. So let's start at number one in the schematic to the right. So that's the interior of your cabinet. 
the product, the stored product is protected by the refrigeration system, removing heat from that cabinet. So picture a bit of heat inside the unit at number one. It gets carried away by the refrigerant in what we call the low stage system. So it's sometimes called the second stage for purposes of today. We'll call it the low stage system. So this bit of heat gets carried through the system past the low stage compressor at number two and into the cascade exchanger at number three. So Mark always reminds me that the, uh, the cascade exchanger is the most important part of the system to look at in troubleshooting. All right. So this is where we, the, the heat that we picked up in number one, and we carried it past the compressor at number two, it gets dumped into what we call the high stage system, or sometimes it's called the first stage. Again, for the purposes of today, we'll refer to this as the high stage system that our heat gets dumped into. So it's important to know that the two systems don't actually mix, they just trade heat between them. So once that bit of heat gets moved to the high stage through the cascade condenser at number three, it makes its way into the high stage compressor at four, then into the condenser at number five. So this is where the fan's blowing air out of the freezer. Pretty easy to find. It's normally at the bottom of the unit. Uh, you, you can find that pretty universally on all the manufacturers. All right, so once a bit of heat's at the condenser, it gets kicked out into the air into the room. So the room ambient is represented by number six. Don't worry too much about the other parts on the schematic for now. That's for a little bit more in depth later on uh, in, in another presentation perhaps. But for today, let's focus on the cabinet, the cascade exchanger, and the condenser to follow that same bit of heat out of the system. But, uh, but this time, let's do it using temperature instead of a schematic. All right, so picture again our bit of heat that's sitting in the cabinet, and the cabinet's around minus, minus 86 degrees C. That's down towards the bottom of the graph. So that bit of heat gets carried away by the cold refrigerant at the, uh, at the very bottom of the graph. So almost every manufacturer will give you pretty easy access to this evaporator temperature, and that should be at about minus 90. It'll vary a bit from manufacturer to manufacturer, but about minus 90 is a pretty close estimate. So if it's considerably higher or lower than the minus 90 shown there at the bottom of the graph, um, knowing just that piece of information can really help us to differentiate some of the issues that we'll talk about later. So the heat then moves into that bundle of temperatures you see with the number three next to them. So remember from the last slide that that number three, that's the cascade exchanger. Naturally, it's much warmer since that's where we're moving all the heat to. So there, this could, uh, um, so this should generally be right around minus 40. Again, some variation from manufacturer or, or unit to unit, but around minus 40 is a pretty healthy number. This one's going to be a little bit tougher to get potentially, so it may be a little bit tougher to uh, to find the, the cascade exchanger and get a good temperature on some units depending on manufacturer. But remember, Mark tells me that this is the first place that one of our teams always look at before we start uh, start troubleshooting. So after the, um, so our bit of heat starts in the cabinet, gets pulled out by the, re the refrigerant at minus 90, gets moved into the high stage at minus 40, and then moves to number five. Remember from the last slide that that's the, uh, that's the condenser. So even if the manufacturer doesn't give you this temperature easily accessible through uh, either the monitor or pre-placed thermocouple, this one's pretty easy to get. This one has to be clear for, for air to flow around it. So that one's easy to find. So this temperature then, this should be a little bit warmer than the ambient in the room, maybe five to 10 degrees warmer, much warmer than that. And it's a pretty good indication of some kind of an issue on the high stage. So if you remember those three numbers, you're, uh, you're off and running. All right, so armed with what normal operation and normal conditions look like, let's dig into, uh, let's dig into what might go wrong. So let's talk about two generic types of temperature issues in the ULT, how to tell the difference between them, and what some of the cause, common causes are. So we'll focus today on the root causes that the typical first responder can, can identify and rule out quickly, and then the ones that can be impacted by how the unit is used or maintained. So the first is the fast rise in temperature. So this one's characterized by a really good looking temperature graph that seems to suddenly change to constant warming. You can see that in the bottom right side of the screen. So it's obviously easiest to, to pick this out if you've got a graph uh, on the monitor or if you can download the historical temperatures to see those trends. 
in this type of a failure, failure, you'll need to rule out the easy issues fairly quickly so that you know whether your stored product is at risk. Uh, if there really is a failure in this kind of condition, the ones that look like this don't generally correct themselves. So I'll turn it back over to Mark and we'll dive a little bit deeper into those root causes. Thanks, Brian. Fast rise in temperature. We're going to talk about some of the typical root causes for that. And you're going to see that on a chart recorder on a graph. Uh, you're going to talk about door openings, inventory, warm product, um, your power, any sort of electrical interruptions. Talk about like emergency generators and the switching of emergency generators, uh, brownouts, power surges a little bit. Talk about the compressor start components, the high lows when starting a low stage um, with the types of refrigerants that we're using. We're going to talk about compressor overload sensors, uh, what, the internal ones, which you can't get to, but will definitely cause a problem for you, and then the compressor failures. Our first symptom with the fast rising temperature is the door opening or the loading of inventory or warm product. Uh, use of a manufactured door opening data, if available, gives you a great feedback as far as being able to tell what the end user has been doing with the unit. You'll notice on the picture right here, you'll see that there's a door opening time, 60 minutes. We're viewing in the one day mode right now. And then you have a door opening of 16 times. So that was, the door was open 16 times for 60 minutes and with a total of 28 events that occurred during that 24 hour period of time. So that tells you right there that the end user was in and out of the unit a lot during this period. So when you start looking at that, you need to understand what the user is doing and how they're using the unit. That's very critical to understand what they've been doing with it. You got to educate the end user on how to, how to handle loading the unit and how quickly to be in and out of it. With the unit, like the ULTs, what happens is, is air, ambient air and humidity rush in to fill the cold void within the cabinet. That cold void in the cabinet then absorbs all that moisture and then condenses it as frost on the inside of the cabinet. I'll tell you, there was, a, there was a situation when I worked at Lilly where I had a research scientist that had been taught a long time ago, and a lot of people still do this, is the use of ballast. They put ballast in there typically to help keep the temperature more consistent when they open and get in and out of it. And they do that because they're not sure where everything's at, so they rummage around inside the unit. And this research scientist had filled the, filled the unit with ballast from room temperature, and they put gallon jugs of water in there, half full gallon jugs of water in there, and put five or six of them, I can't remember. But quickly, the unit warmed up and never was able to recover and had to remove all the samples. So be sure when you're putting ballast or using anything, you want to pre-freeze those materials. Pre-freezing the material reduces the load on the ULT in the refrigeration system. Remember when we talked earlier at the start of this, there's not a lot of refrigerant to do high loads, and the pressures in, in the system are extremely low, so you want to maintain that operating parameter. Also, visual notification of inventory are being loaded, so you'll see where maybe the door was probably opened up around the, the 20 to the 20 hundred marks, so you want to look at that. and. And you can talk to the customer, and when they tell you they've not been in it, you can also go back and look at the events and reference and tell them, you know, we, we can tell you're in there and you were loading it. One of the other symptoms is going to be a power electrical interruption. So you always want to make sure you check your main voltage. Make sure the voltage is within the range of the manufacturer's nameplate. If you get outside of that, that range, what you're going to do is you're going to incur added wear on the compressor when it goes to start. You're going to add extra load and pressure problems on the start components. If you have the graph, you can download the data and look at the graph and graph out the historical information also. Do a visual inspection of the circuit breakers. Not only the circuit breaker on the unit, but also go back to the circuit breaker in the, in the electrical vault. Check that panel. Make sure that you don't have any burn marks or anything on the, on the breaker. Make sure the breaker is not hot. Do a visual inspection of the electrical connectors within the unit. Look for burnt hot wires, any sign of charring, burning insulation, uh, dark colored areas. That, that's an indication of a high load. 
with a high load, you're going to have the high amperage and you're going to burn the wiring. And usually that's going to be a sign, the first sign that you have a loose connection or you got a compressor that's starting to draw too many amps when it starts. Make sure you also apply the proper safety measures when you start inspecting and checking everything. Make sure that the power has been removed from the unit before you start doing your inspections and poking around inside the electrical panel. The best tools for this is going to be your multimeter and the use of the manufacturer's schematics. Some of the preventive ma maintenance measures are going to be make sure you have a dedicated supply power source. Make sure that you, the plugs are reduced from being accidentally disconnected or removed from the unit when it pulled away from the wall. So Mark, can I jump on in with uh, with one quickly? So Mark told me a story about uh, a previous experience he had where um, there were a number of units lined up in uh, in in the hall, and the, the cleaning crew came through, and uh, and was starting to uh, to use some of the same outlets for some of the vacuum cleaners and and some of uh, some of their cleaning work. Um, so you know, as you can imagine, as you start overloading those circuits, um, pretty much everything is going to trip on there. It's pretty tough sometimes to diagnose where that where that real uh, real root cause came from. So it's really important to make sure that in your facilities you're really using the dedicated circuit and uh, and it's well marked and, and very clear so that you don't have uh, have those kind of interruptions. Thanks, Brian. One of the other things is going to be a compressor issue. The first thing that you have and the best is your senses, your sense of sight, your sense of smell, and your the sense of sound. So if you have a failed start component, you're going to hear a humming or a buzzing noise typically when the compressors are trying to start. And then that's the first indication that typically you have a problem with the uh, start components. Also, use your multimeter and check the amp draw on the unit. So you're going to have a very high or extended period of a high amp draw, typically in the, in the 20 to 30 second range. This is also likely a failed start component. Again, depending on how that component starts, how that component fails, pardon me. You're going to be looking at also maybe some added noise, like the buzz or, the, or a uh, humming sound where it's just trying to start but nothing's happening, similar to a light ballast. If you have a very high for a brief time, like just a several seconds, there's likely an internal overload in the compressor that's malfunctioning for whatever reason, but it could also be created by the uh, start components being bad. If that start capacitor is actually completely faulty, it will apply voltage and will trip the, trip the start, the internal overloads, rather quickly. Also, if you have very low amps and the compressor is running and you can verify the compressor is running, unfortunately, likely that's not a good sign. That's going to be a sign of uh, more than likely an internal compressor failure. Either a connecting rod has failed um, or you've got a valve that's failed or maybe even you've uh, lost charge. The loss of charge will actually reduce the load on the compressor and it will just continue to run. So those are the three things that you'll find if the compressor is running, but not, it's not maintaining temperature. One of the things you can also do is to check the temperature discharge from the compressor. That's a fast confirmation that the system is running and that there is refrigerant in the unit. So that would be the discharge line coming from the compressor, not the actual top of the compressor. Top of the compressor will be warm just because of the movement of the components inside of it and the motor running. So you'll want to check just a little bit away from the compressor to feel if there is any heat coming from the discharge line of the compressor. Again, the best tools for this are going to be your sight, the sound, and the smell. Your multimeter is also a very good device at this time. You can also use the multimeter to ohm out a compressor if you feel you might have a faulty compressor and you use the Fluke 52 or the thermometer to check some of the thermocouples placed around the unit. Again, some of the preventive maintenance, as Brian shared, is the dedicated power supply. Never plug one of these into a GFI. They're going to be borderline as far as being able to handle the load. Never, I don't recommend the use of duplex outlets like you'd see at your house. I, I recommend the single outlets just for the example that Brian shared earlier. That's why you use a dedicated circuit and a dedicated outlet strictly for that. Make sure your voltage is reliable. Make sure it's not fluctuating up and down. Maybe if you have a, a device that's plugged into the same panel that's a high amp draw, 
I know one of the blood centers uh, recently that we were visiting, they had a, uh, a fast freeze unit. And whenever that fast freeze unit would start up, it would drop the voltage down below 202 volts. And that can prove very hard on the uh, start components because most compressors are going to be 208 to 230. And as you drop that voltage, it makes it more it makes it more and more uh, difficult for the compressor to get started as that puts more wear and load on the capacitor. Some of the simple preventive maintenance, make sure you follow your manufacturer's guidance on that. Make sure you clean the filter. That filter is also going to keep the inside of the unit cool. As the unit warms up, it also is going to create a higher amp draw. So our second generic type of failure is uh, is characterized by a far more erratic temperature graph. So this one tends to build up over time. And frankly, some of these are, are maddening to try to diagnose. So you'll see either a much slower warming trend in, in the order of days instead of hours, um, or you'll see an uneven random temperature cycle. Um, and, and that kind of thing indicates that the system's still running, but it's definitely not running in the way that it's supposed to. So you generally, in this case, have a little more time to protect your product with this kind of a temperature issue. But keep in mind that the erratic nature can turn into a full failure pretty much at any time. Uh, so some of these causes are very easy to spot. Mark can go through some of those. Some of these take a pretty deep dive to diagnose. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll mention some of those. Um, so I'll give it back to Mark to run through some of the details. Thanks again, Brian. Typical root causes of a slow rise in temperature would be excessive frost in the cabinet. We're going to talk about some of the maybe reduction in airflow, what that's going to do. Talk about oil logging. Um, any of you are familiar with this, or this is a very old term that's been associated with ULTs for a long period of time. Moisture in the system or an actual leak in the system. Excess frost in the cabinet. Look for irregular frost patterns for evidence of an air leak. As you can see in the picture, on the, in the gasket on the right-hand side, you'll see the white line on that gasket. That white line shows an indication where air is infiltrating into the cabinet. That infiltration is creating a lazy frost pattern. That's what we call a lazy frost pattern, where it's just a real light buildup. You can just barely dust it, and it's going to fall off. Sometimes it'll be bad enough where you'll have an ice buildup right at the point where it's leaking the air in, and then it'll also have the have a tail that'll show a light frost pattern. Always visually inspect the gaps in the gasket contact. You want to check the ambient conditions. Is the humidity high in the area you're, you're, you have the unit placed? One of the worst places for these is in a mechanical area. Mechanical areas always have sump pumps, sump pits in there, high moisture contents in the air. Remember when we talked earlier that we talked about how the air rushes in to fill that cold void? Well, that air and humidity is rushing in there, and that helps create that frost. You want to take advantage of adjustability and door alignments, the use of shims and slots to do that, and also any sort of horizontal adjustment that you can do on the door to make better alignment and ensure the door is in contact. Your best tools are going to be your visual inspection, obviously. And I actually still use the old-fashioned dollar bill method. That's where you put a dollar bill between the gasket and the mullion, close the door, and try to pull it out. It should pull out with a lot of drag on it, and in some cases may not even pull out at all. If it pulls out real easy, then that door, that part of the gasket needs to be adjusted. Some of the preventive maintenance, you want to make sure you do periodic cleaning of the gasket and any normal frost that might be building up around the door and the door gasket. Remember, this is minus 86. That door opens up, and that whole flat surface is going to gather any of the moisture that's in the air. Do a periodic check of the door alignment, ensuring that the door is square with the mullion. Periodically check the door gasket. Make sure that the door gasket has no deformation in it. Make sure that the end user hasn't tried to utilize a, a scraper, putty knife, or a screwdriver and try to chisel some of the ice or frost buildup off of it and poke a hole into the gasket. That'll damage, that'll just ruin the ability to seal and allow any moisture to get through that 
that gasket very quickly. Also make sure that there's the door gaskets attached to the door itself all the way around. Anywhere where that won't be attached, you're also going to have that frost line build up. Airflow. You want to check and clear the air at, at the inlet of the condensing unit. Some manufacturers have filters. Some of them have a washable media. Some of them have replaceable media. So you want to make sure you keep that, that clean and free so that that unit can breathe and allow air to move across the condenser. And it also moves air across the compressors. And again, this is utilized to cool the compressor. So you want to check and clean the condenser air filter. And that is one of the main causes of, of air problems and temperature problems with the ULT. Check your ambient conditions. Is the freezer warming the room up? Being you have a freezer room and you have five or six of them in there and you just don't have enough air in there elevating the temperature, that's going to reduce the performance and the life cycle of the, of the unit. One of the things is make sure you know the area that you're putting the unit. When I was at Lilly, one of the things that happened is they turned a room into a freezer room, but the room happened to be on the HVAC system that was on a night setback. And for the first week, week and a half, we were having problems where it was just sporadic alarms within the room. And that was all generated just because the unit was being shut off at night and the room got too warm and we were sending alarms back to the environmental utilities room. Some of your best, best tools, obviously, are going to be your visual inspection. Know where the unit's at. Make sure that there's, if there's a carpeted area or if it's in a hallway with carpet, you're going to build up more dirt and more lint during that time period just because the carpet sheds than you are if you're on a vinyl floor. Preventive me measures, obviously, clean the condensing filter, clean the condenser coils. One of the other things you want to do is move the unit away from the walls to ensure that the air is able to flow behind it. The unit has to breathe. It has to pass air, draw air from one side of the unit, and expel it out the other side so that they can keep the bottom and the co components in the bottom of the unit cool. Oil logging. This has uh, been an issue with ULTs for many, many years. The newer units are being better designed and handle it much better. But remember when Brian was talking about it, the temperatures of the evaporator at the evaporator inlet is normally around minus 90 C. Oils freeze in the minus 50 to minus 60 area. So as you can see, the oil is going to freeze at that minus 90. That's why you see where manufacturers add another refrigerant type in with it to give you a blended refrigerant in order to help keep the oil moving throughout the system. One of the things you want to do is ins inspect the historical temperature data if it's available. Is the temperature rise consistent, which is somewhat unlikely to be oil? I have seen it where oil will just slowly continually build up and temperature drift up, and that usually takes a month or so for it to drift up. Or you can see it, as Brian described earlier, where you have the sawtooth pattern and it just doesn't seem to want to pull all the way down. It's maintaining, but it's not maintaining where we need it to be. And the compressors will be running continuously. They never shut off. The way to solve that, though, is going to be you have to unload the unit, warm the unit completely for at least 24 hours in a nice, warm environment. That oil will then thin back out and run and drop back down to the uh, compressor and the oil separator down in the unit. Go ahead and restart the unit and monitor it closely. And then usually after about 48 to 72 hours, you can probably begin to reload it. It is likely to repeat that problem again, but again, that's a product of loading all the extra products that we talked about and loading it with warm materials. That puts that added strain and moves more, increases the pressures, and when you increase the pressures, you're going to increase the amount of oil that's moved throughout the system. So your best tools are, again, the visual inspection, some of the preventive measures. If you ever have to work on one of these, use only the oil additive specified by the manufacturer. And when you have to have maintenance and service done on it, make sure you use a reputable service provider, one preferably, preferably provided and recommended by the owner, the manufacturer of the unit. 
Again, uh, one of the other issues is going to be a moisture release in the system. These are both uncommon from the factory, but they can be introduced primarily during field service. That's when you're going to see this occur. Uh, the use of the gauges and putting the manifolds on the system, you're going to introduce contaminants in it. Moisture is the biggest contaminant that you're going to find in ULT. ULTs are actually operating typically in a vacuum. So when they're operating in a vacuum, if you have any sort of leak or any sort of dirty hoses or anything like that, you're going to pull that stuff in there. So that's why we recommend the use of a uh, reputable service provider. Again, this is going to be characterized primarily by a consistent slow rise in temperature. It's not going to be erratic, as you saw in the oil, but it will be a nice, steady, even pattern rising itself up, and you will know, and the cycle rates will also disappear in any of your graphing. Preventive maintenance. Again, we talked several points about that. This is from the Helmer Manual. This is our recommended maintenance. This is representative of all the manufacturers. They're all right in the same general area and general amount of time frame. But you want to make sure you inspect all the electrical components and wiring terminals in the electrical box for any of the discoloration, as we mentioned earlier. This is a clear indication that something's not correct within the system. It may still be maintaining temperature. But it may still be maintaining temperature, but we'll have to uh, take a look at why that might be caused, and which is, again, loose connections, star components wearing down, breaking down. Inspect and clean the condenser and the condenser filter. Defrost and clean the chamber and the exterior door gaskets and the interior door gaskets. Enclosure, we've covered a lot of material so far today. I want to thank Brian and Ben for helping put this together and holding it with me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark and Brian, for sharing your experience and expertise in this webinar. We are now ready to move to questions and answers. As a, as a reminder, our participants can submit their questions using the question pane on the control panel on the screen. And we, we did have a little bit of an interruption here, I think based on a, a lightning strike in the area, but hopefully you can still see um, our screen. Uh, so for our first question, the first question, uh, which I'm going to direct towards Mark, is how frequently should I defrost my unit? Uh, that's, there is. The, the real answer is there is no correct response. It all depends on activity with the ULT and the environment that it's been created in. And that the ULT, as we talked about, is going to draw moisture and warm humid air into the system. So if they're in and out of the unit, you're going to have frost build up a lot more frequently. Double check where the frost is built up. If it's built up within the cabinet, then you're going to have to. It's going to affect the amount of heat that it can absorb and remove from the product that's being stored in there. It's just on the surface of the of the doors that access the compartments and on the inside of the, the door, then you probably don't need to be defrosting it near as often. But that's it's really a product of what of what the environment that the ULT is being placed in. So Mark, can I jump in quickly as well on there? So um, in, in some of our really high load testing, we found a couple of things that would really trigger uh, trigger a massive defrost. Um, so there's there's one instance where you really can build up enough frost that sort of melts and refreezes, melts and refreezes, enough that you can actually interfere with the overall door closing. Um, over time you get uh, you get into a position where you're forcing the door shut and forcing that uh, that latch in position. You can really put a bunch of stress on the uh, on the door. Um, so I think that would be a pretty good indication on on having to, uh, to pull it out and, and, and defrost. The other one we've seen is in uh, some high uh, you know some high usage uh, environments. Some of the racks that are used to store product in the ULT those actually become completely unusable even during normal operation. Um, you know the reality is that just for the frost forms in a in a ULT, 
And uh, you know, once it gets to the point where those racks are, are becoming unusable, usable, I think that's a pretty good indication. Um, could be uh, could be a six month, could be uh, could be once a year. Great, thanks, Blaine. Thanks, Mark. Um, just as a reminder to our participants, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and submit them using the question pane on the control panel in the webinar. Um, the next question is. How much clearance do I need above and behind the freezer to ensure proper performance? Typically, it's recommended for eight inches behind it. And depending on where your your vents are to exhaust the air, that could be either eight inches on the sides or eight inches on the rear. And always keep the front of the unit open. That's where most all the units have their air intake for the condenser. Most of them have a uh, standoff brackets, and always ensure the standoff brackets are available and installed. Great, thanks, Mark. And again, we have oh, we we do have a, a, a another question that just came in. Um, the question is, um, do any of the ULTs have auto defrost um, technology? No, not to, not that I'm aware of. I've never seen one with uh, an auto for defrost. Okay. Next question is: What is the control range of the ULT freezer? So most of the freezers out there on the market will run anywhere between minus 50 down to uh, down to minus 86. I think a lot, most of the uh, uh, the applications that we've run into uh, just generically call it a minus 80, and I think that's where a, a, a fair bit of the the, uh, the industry uses them. But really, you can safely use it anywhere within uh, within that range. Now, again, refer back to your manufacturer's specs. I don't want to speak for for everybody out there, but in general terms, between minus 50 and uh, and minus 86, we do want to caution you against setting it higher than that. So you really can do some some real fundamental damage to a to a ULT by intentionally running it at higher temperature ranges. Uh, these things really are most comfortable running uh, running down into in the cold ranges. So certainly don't try to try to substitute out a minus 40 by just setting your your ULT up a little bit higher. Great, thanks, Brian. And it looks like uh, that was our our last question um, listed in, in in the webinar. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everyone for participating in our event this afternoon. Please use the emails uh, that are shown on your screen uh, to, to contact. Oh, sorry about that. Please use the emails that are displayed on your screen if you'd like to contact our Helmer Sales or Technical Services teams. If you have any feedback or comments you'd like to share about our webinar program, uh, please feel free to reach out directly to me, uh, Ben Greenfield, at bgreenfield at helmerinc.com. All registrants of this webinar will automatically receive a survey um, as well, so we look forward to getting feedback. We hope to follow up on our event today with additional webinar, webinars um, with topics that are, that are coming from you, our customers. This concludes today's program. Thanks again for attending.